Good morning, folks, uh, and, and thanks to uh, Anand and Savita for that uh, wonderful session on uh, uh, CACD pipelines as code. And, uh, and welcome to our session on uh, continuous profiling with uh, Parka. Uh, and in this session, we'll uh, take a deep dive into the world of uh, continuous profiling and, and discover how Parka uh, helps initiate that uh, process uh, easier. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a look at this uh, CPU, uh, CPU usage metrics graph. Uh, and I bet uh, it triggers deja vu for a lot of us in the, in the room today, like uh, the, the random spikes uh, that disrupt the otherwise calm, line, uh, calm baseline. So uh, it, it usually like, uh, would have occurred once or twice in a uh, lot of times in our career. So, um, and, and whenever uh, something like this happens, like uh, theories often uh, emerge within the teammates. Like one might attribute these spikes to uh, the garbage collection runs, and, and someone else might suggest it's uh, it's triggered by a problematic code ba code path uh, in the admin uh, user, users uh, uh, tasks and stuff like that. And and those are theories, and 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 theories are theories, and and what we need is data. So data something like this. Uh, that uh, that can give a um, uh, detailed idea into like uh, what was really consuming the CPU uh, during those spikes, uh, and even uh, to the uh, to the details of up to uh, the functions and the line numbers in the code uh, where the resources are being spent. Uh, and and imagine how much easier it would have been uh, if we had these kind of solid data to uh, to back our theories in the first place. Uh, and that's the uh, power of continuous profiling. Um, it, it makes your uh, performance uh, debugging experience smoother and, and also like insightful. Um, yeah. Uh, so who are we? Like I'm uh, Manoj, a software engineer at Polar Signals, and, and I'm an open source enthusiast. Uh, and I'm also a maintainer of Parka, which we're going to uh, talk a lot about today. Uh, and I'm also a creator of uh, Responsibly app. So that's on a totally different vertical from what I'm going to talk about today. So it's a uh, dev tool for front-end developers. So pass it along if you have any uh, friends or colleagues who are into uh, front-end development. Um, yeah, and that's about me, Sumira. Hello, uh, I'm Sumira. Um, so I stare at all the pretty icicle graphs, uh, Manoj builds all day. So that's my day job. And uh, I am also an open source maintainer of Parka Agent and Parka Dave. Uh, and I've been working at Polar Signals for two years now almost uh, with this product. And I'm very excited to uh, share uh, what we have built uh, with you all. Now it's over to Manoj. Uh, he'll carry on, and I'll be back in a bit. So uh, let's jump straight into the uh, heart of the discussion today, profiling. Um, profiling is, uh, is a phenomenon that's been around since uh, the 60s. Like, uh, it, it evolved with the time when uh, modern programming languages were, uh, were getting uh, evolved. So uh, and, and let's break it down. Like, profiling is, is all about uh, analyzing a program's execution with an emphasis on uh, measuring how the resources are being used by the program. And by resources here, it can be CPU, memory, or like I/O or whatever. Um, and, and also, like uh, it, it gives reports uh, that are very detailed um, up to the line number in the code that says like where uh, the resources are being spent uh, and, and things like that. Uh, there are different approaches to profiling, and, and today we are going to uh, focus on sample profiling. So uh, sample profiling is an, uh, is an approach where we, uh, we observe a program's execution for a fixed amount of time. Say, for some 10 seconds, we observe a program's execution. And during those 10 seconds, like, uh, we sample uh, the program's function call stack uh, for, for every like, constant interval, say, like 100 times per second. So, so by doing that, over the course of the 10 seconds, we'll have uh, 1,000 uh, samples to work with. And that's a good enough number uh, to get an idea into uh, what was really happening within the, uh, within the program. Um, yeah, and, and, and considering the fact that uh, sample profilers don't uh, like continuously monitor each and every change in the program, uh, it's very uh, low in terms of the overhead and also like uh, making it suitable for, uh, for, for a lot of uh, common overload that we run in our cloud. So, uh, so why do you want to uh, profile our applications, right? 
one uh, to uh, to make our applications faster uh, say uh, you run an e-commerce store and uh, and in the e-commerce world uh, the the golden rule is pretty clear right like your sales numbers are uh, directly tied to how your uh, how fast your website is so uh, so the profiling comes in and helps you uh, identify the bottlenecks so that um, you can uh, address those and and like potentially uh, increase your sales numbers and also and also to uh, cut cost on your uh, infra bills um, usually like applications run code where 30% uh, of the resources are uh, spent on easily optimizable code which we which we don't uh, optimize because we don't have the insight that uh, it's being wasted so one with with continuous profiling you'll get clear insights into uh, which parts of the code it's do uh, like wasting the resources so that you can um, strategically like apply uh, uh, optimizations to those and and like in turn uh, cut your cloud bills so uh, like we just saw profiling is uh, is an incredible uh, tool right but uh, but it, but traditional profiling it has its uh, limitations uh, it, it's very momentary like uh, whenever you run profiling you'll get the samples and uh, and once you stop it uh, you're, you're not going to know what's happening in the in the application so that's uh, momentary and, and also it's very manual um, you you face an issue then you set up profilers and start collecting profiles and and stop it. You'll, you'll, you'll have to do the cycle again whenever you uh, run into a performance problem again. And also, like it, it's not very easy to uh, get profiles from production. Uh, you'll have to like either SSH into the instance or, uh, or probably like port forward uh, to a local and, and and extract the profiles from your application. So uh, all these are like uh, both uh, time consuming and also uh, very error prone. Uh, when we do when we do it in our uh, production applications, and and considering uh, the fact how powerful profiling is and and the developer experience is uh, is not so ideal, so so we wanted to uh, solve that problem some uh, somehow, and, um, and and that's where uh, the continuous profiling uh, comes into picture. So uh, continuous profiling, uh, like the uh, like the name says, like uh, it's an act of continuously uh, collecting profiles from uh, from your application over a set duration of time so, uh, or, or the lifetime of the program so that you, you have a constant trail of what's happening within, the, within your applications. Uh, and since, uh, like we already mentioned, uh, the, the sample profiling is very low uh, in terms of overhead, um, we can, uh, like with any other pr profiling uh, observability data, like you'll not know when you'll need the data. So, so it's always good to uh, collect it at low head using continuous, prof continuous profiling. So, uh, so how does the whole thing work, right? Like, so uh, we we employ the sample uh, profilers to continuously uh, uh, collect profiles from from all the processes that are run uh, that are running in a node, and and uh, and we tag the data with uh, with uh, with required met meta metadata that will uh, later allow us to um, slice and dice the data to get uh, profiles from each and every workload that we uh, specifically need to look into. Um, so in addition to uh, solving the, uh, the developer experience problem of traditional profiling, uh, continuous profiling also uh, brings in uh, a bunch of uh, benefits on, on top of that. Uh, one, your, your development is in uh, production. Uh, uh, like even though we, we strive so hard to uh, make our development environments like as close as uh, production, um, we we simply won't be able to uh, replicate the same workload in our local, uh, and 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 by by not doing that, we are going to uh, uh, miss out on the crucial data that we uh, get from the production over workloads. Uh, and and continuous uh, profiling like helps uh, solve that gap. And also the data and context over time, right? So once you uh, employ a continuous profiler, you'll, you'll have this profile trail over time, uh, so like across various events like rollouts and, and also like production incidents. Uh, so that like whenever a, a deployment happens and, and, your, and if your performance numbers go south, like you can uh, go compare the profiles before the deployment and, and after the deployment and see and I see exactly like uh, which part of your application has degraded and and see like what's wrong and, and fix it immediately so that you will uh, uh, eliminate the regression in your performance goals um, 
Yeah, so the, the GIST is like, uh, it, it's possible, uh, absolutely possible to uh, profile your production or, or cloud all the time. And also, like, we employ our uh, continuous profiler in our production environments, and, and also, like, our users do that all the while. And, and by doing so, like, uh, in addition to uh, the performance insights, with, with the help of uh, the, the profile data, we, day to day, we discover, like, uh, even different uh, insights into, into our own code and that helps us solve bugs and, and even other kind of stuff. So, uh, so how do you tap into these benefits, right? So Parka is our uh, answer to that. Uh, Parka is an open source continuous profiler uh, developed by uh, Polar Signals. And, and it easily integrates with uh, Kubernetes environments. Um, it, it runs an agent to collect the profiles. And the agent is deployed as a, uh, uh, as a daemon set. Uh, and it's also an uh, eBPF-based uh, zero instrumentation profiler, so it doesn't uh, need any code changes to your application. You just have to deploy the agent as a daemon set, and, and it uh, starts its magic. So it, it discovers the uh, processes, uh, each and every process that runs in the node, and, uh, and it attaches profilers to all of those and, and collecting samples from those. And it also like um, uh, indexes the collected profiles with, uh, with Kubernetes metadata like uh, label values. Uh, so that later, uh, whenever there is an issue, you can uh, query for the exact uh, key value pair that you're looking for and, and extract the data for those. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, Parka's architecture. So it, it has a very uh, simple, straightforward architecture where uh, the agent, uh, the eBPF-based agent, it, it collects the profiles. Um, a bit more on that from Sumera in a bit. Um, and, and it sends the profiles to uh, the Parka server, where we um, process the data, like do a bunch of uh, uh, symbolization and, and other uh, enhancements to that. And we save it to uh, the profile store, uh, which is backed by uh, a FrostDB, which is a custom-built uh, columnar embeddable store uh, that we specifically developed at uh, Polar Signals again. Uh, and that in turn like stores the data into uh, the object store, um, and the same happens from the from the UI. Like whenever we want to query something, uh, it, it sends a request to the querier that uh, in turn uh, gets the necessary, necessary data from the profile store, and and, it, and we render cool reports on the UI. Okay, uh, let's uh, take a quick look at uh, how um, how Parka like works and uh, and how it will uh, help us solve the uh, performance problems. Uh, if, if you're curious, like uh, you can go to demo dot parka dot dev on your own and uh, and have an hands on experience on on how it works. Okay. Um, uh, this is the uh, Parka's uh, profile explorer. Uh, we can, like, on a high level, we can uh, um, divide it into three parts. Like, the first one is the uh, the, the query selector, where you uh, like apply the queries to get the specific uh, data for the specific workload, and uh, okay, looks like. The demo guards are not not with us today, but but I still have uh, the local running. I'll I'll try and pull that up. Okay, so uh, we can see the metrics graph uh, below that. Um, uh, the the metrics graph, like uh, right now, we are we are seeing just one uh, one metrics in the metrics graph. That's because uh, my local I'm just processing a single process. But uh, in in, a, uh, in your production node, you'll you'll be able to see like uh, uh, one uh, metrics uh, line for each of the process that you run, so that like you can see uh, up to the de uh, details like um, what's being uh, consumed and and how much each process is uh, uh, is using the CPU and stuff like that. And and below that we have the uh, visualization section where. Uh, where we can um, see uh, see more details on, uh, on on within the application what was happening that was uh, taking up the CPU. So uh, th this is an uh, this visualization is called icicle graph. This is uh, most commonly used uh, visualization for uh, performance data. 
um, on a high level, like um, uh, the, the, the flame graph, the, the, the icicle graphs, like uh, the vertical space taken by each of the node, uh, it represents how much resource it takes. Say, for this root node, uh, it represents 100% uh, of uh, resource usage. And, and, and within that node, like, uh, we can see uh, each of the stack traces and, and how much resource it takes. Um, and, and things like that. So, so this one, it, uh, the root usually takes 100% since it, like, uh, it combines everything within that process. And within that, here if you see the, the scrape loop has taken 16% uh, of the CPU and, and the serve has taken 11% uh, and, and the runtime has taken 55% uh, and so on. Um, yeah, you can also like uh, dive deeper into specific sections here. Like, say you want to know what's uh, within the scrape, you can click on it and it will expand the uh, the call stack within that, so that you can drill deeper. Like, go into the the IO and and see uh, more more details on on each of those. Um, yeah, uh, that's about it. And and also like uh, uh, the the query section, you can uh, you can use the Kubernetes. Uh, uh, label values to, uh, to to query for specific workloads. Say we'll have instance and uh, so this, this just runs in my local, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, Kubernetes metadata. But but in our production or uh, somewhere where we uh, enrich the processes with metadata, you, you can query them with, uh, with with each and one of the uh, data that that's there. Um, yeah, and another uh, like cool thing that we can do, like I was uh, mentioning before, comparing profiles be before and after the uh, deployment, you can ask, use this compare uh, um, feature where um, you'll, you'll have like two metrics graph now, and and, you, uh, and on this like you can select two profiles, one on the left and one on the right, and and so that we'll we'll uh, compare both and and see like how it performed. So I've selected two points here, and, and the visualization now shows a, a, a comparison of these two profiles, a differential view of these two profiles. And, and the things that are green are, uh, are improved in the second point uh, compared to the first one, and, and the red things are the ones that are degraded in performance. Um, so say, uh, like, uh, I'll, I'll compare uh, a point where there was a high CPU utilization with, uh, with the one uh, that's with less CPU utilization. So that we will see a lot of white, uh, like a lot of green here, since uh, the the performance has has improved between the compared points. And and if we compare a low point here and an high point, high point here, um, we'll we'll see more data in in red, since uh, since the CPU utilization on the second uh, point is higher than the uh, the first one. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing is uh, the, the targets. The targets, uh, like uh, in the Prometheus targets, it, uh, it gives an idea into uh, uh, what the agents are, uh, what are the agents that are running and, uh, and that are uh, sending data to the uh, Parka server. Um, and talking about agents, uh, I'm going to uh, hand over uh, to Sumera now to uh, talk about all the magic that uh, the agent does. Hello, um, I'm back. So uh, you saw all these pretty uh, stack traces that uh, Manoj was just showing you. And, but how does all of that information come from? Uh, that's basically what the agent does. It collects um, all of this metadata, you know, like uh, the name of the, for any binary that you're running, the name of the process, uh, the name of the pod, the name of your cluster, uh, process ID, it, it discovers all the binaries and uh, it collects information about them, makes that into stack traces. That's where we use uh, eBPF under the hood in kernel space. Then it uh, compresses them into a format 
like a very uh, low space uh, taking optimized format, and then it sends them to the Parka server for uh, visualization. So, but where's the magic? So it's zero instrumentation, you know, you just deploy. Since we do this in the, uh, all of it's automated, all you need to do is like, uh, you don't have to do any scripting, you just need to run the binary with one or two flags, and you're good to go. More magic, it's very low overhead. Uh, we are actually doing some very uh, low level things like reading registers at some point, uh, but we do them using eBPF, so um, we have extremely low overhead. It does not actually take up uh, CPU space, and it does not affect anything else that you're running on your machine or your clusters, so it doesn't interfere at all. Next thing, so how do we do this target discovery, though? So you just saw uh, these in the uh, stack traces that Manoj was sh just showing. All of this information, we take a binary, and uh, the agent has uh, discovers all these targets or the binaries, and then uh, it's, we sort of get a list of targets. Like uh, if you see at the bottom of the screen, you can see the process ID. You know that three nine one seven four. And the Parker agent CPU, and you see uh, there's the the highlighted part in green. It's uh, it's the name of the binary. It's for VS Code, you know. And VS Code is, I think, somebody something that everybody is familiar with. It's a code editor. Um, so target discovery in the agent is system wide. Uh, if it's a binary, if it's a process. Um, it doesn't, like, we profile it. Whether it's containerized, whether it's bare metal, uh, we profile it. And we discover all the binaries associated with the process. And this means you can see stack traces for everything that's running on your system down to the last system call. And uh, so I was talking about VS Code, right? This is what VS Code looks like under the hood. Uh, it's intentionally um, an older image from like a few months ago when I was developing this for like uh, jittered stacks. Uh, VS Code runs, uh, it's an Electron app, right? So it runs V8, uh, an engine under the hood, and uh, we were just uh, compiling uh, and profiling just-in-time stacks and developing support for them. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized that there's some WASM code also, WebAssembly code running down there. Uh, and uh, it's a WASM wrapper and compiler kit, I think. And that, that was my galaxy brain moment, right? I use VS Code extensively. And to see what's going on underneath and to discover something cool like WASM, which I wouldn't know about otherwise, um, it really made an impact. Uh, it hit that, you know, there's real life impact of what I'm doing. That, that was a very aha moment for me. So the next thing is, uh, how do you go from this VS code to seeing all the functions in an icicle graph? So uh, I'll not go into super detailed stuff here, but uh, you have a binary, any application. Uh, I've used Go binaries as an example, but this extends approximately to all Linux binaries. Uh, binaries look a bit like this under the surface. There's executable code, and uh, there is a there is other information about uh, memory addresses and functions and memory mappings. And so how to read these ELF binaries? They're known as ELF binaries for Linux. So how to read them is the, it's encoded in this format called dwarf. Um, suffice to say that dwarf is like a 500, 400 page format specification that I will not go into right now. But uh, we got your back. So what the agent does, it takes all of this um, information from the binaries. It uh, does some very cool things like uh, reading all the information, interpreting it, uh, reads the registers. Uh, and it uh, changes that into this very handcrafted artisanal stack traces. We actually do build this table a lot like uh, sort of by hand. We, have to, we had to do all of the calculations on paper first, and then it was done automated uh, in the code. So 
Then we get this return addresses of functions, you know. So we get like a call order. Uh, the first function's calling this, and that's calling the second function, and we get all the addresses of that function in memory. Um, then we compress it, and we send that to the server side. And then we attach all the function names, which we have also gotten from like uh, the binary information. Uh, it just is less data uh, and more optimal to send it to the uh, server side and then get the function names. And uh, as you can see, function names are essentially just return addresses uh, in a linked list. So that's how we do that. Uh, OK, but next question, how often do we do this? You know, we want to continuously profile, right? We want to see uh, things happening dynamically in real time uh, because we want all the data, you know. Uh, we can't wait till a uh, um kill happens and the entire system uh, crashes and everything hangs. Uh, and uh, to like find out where the bug was, we want to see the bug as it's taking up space, you know, so that we can do something. Or we want to uh, like um, later troubleshoot what went wrong. So how often do we uh, profile? Uh, the way this happens is we profile. Um, we take samples 19 times every second, so 19 hertz. The eBPF program, it, uh, it's attached as a perf event hook. Um, perf event hooks are basically um, they're event hooks in the CPU that let us look inside what's going on in the Linux kernel. And so all the syscalls, all the processes you're calling, every CPU event, basically, that has to do with performance. Um, and uh, the eBPF agent, it's attached to that. And it, uh, it every like 19 times per uh, second, it uh, takes uh, the samples and collects the data. And it puts them into eBPF maps and enriches the eBPF maps. Then from the kernel, we send whatever's information there in the eBPF maps to the user space of Parker agent. Uh, every 10 seconds. So, so basically, you have data, a continuous stream of data all the time. Uh, and it's, it's very optimized. It's, we do it at a very low overhead. Uh, and there's a special reason why we use 19. It, things just work better with uh, prime numbers. Uh, something it's very cool is that uh, there are interruptions and all. You have CPU interrupts, right, in the kernel space and everything. And uh, they can happen at like they they tend to happen at like timed scheduled intervals. So, but if you have like and multiples of that. So, if you have a prime number, prime numbers are not multiples of anything. So, uh, we want to minimize uh, interrupts and any funky interactions that's going on, which is why we choose a prime number. We prefer a prime number. So. Now, uh, overview of what we just saw. <laughs> the, uh, the agent uh, looks at all the processes, every process running on your system, every binary, be it bare metal, container. Uh, and uh, it takes information from them using eBPF in kernel space. Uh, then it compresses them into stack traces, uh, sends over the stack traces to Parka. Uh, throughout this process, we attach a lot of metadata uh, from like the C groups, from uh, your container labels like pods, which cluster, which node, uh, and then from the compiler runtime, which language, which version of uh, the compiler, like GCC 1.20 or any of that, uh, and then whether it's jittered or not. And then we take uh, some more data from like the system daemon, uh, where is the binary located on your CPU? So it will directly show you user bin. What's the name of the binary that you can that you usually use to run uh, from the uh, from your terminal? So uh, and, and on Parka side, it like uh, we see the icicle graphs, and that shows us uh, what's being how much CPU things are consuming. And all of this is no code changes required. You just deploy the agent, and you deploy the server. There's all two lines of code, just the command. And uh, yeah, you have that. So now, uh, what compilers and runtimes do we support? This is important. Like, uh, It's important to know what you can profile and you what, what you can't. So 
We have full support for all natively compiled languages like C, C++, Rust, Go, and um, other languages. Um, very recently, a uh, few months ago, we added uh, support for just-in-time compiled languages. So with PerfMap or Jotum, you can like um, do C Sharp, Erlang. So uh, by Erlang, you know anything that uses Beam underneath, you can profile that. Uh, there's uh, Java Virtual Machine. So anything that uses uh, JVM, like even Java, but also like Clojure, maybe that you can profile that. There's uh, Julia that you can profile. So if uh, anyone's into data science and is using Julia, you can uh, look at what functions using how much CPU, then Node.js. So that's how we, uh, VS Code worked, and uh, how also like uh, profiling Firefox uh, and uh, your bro other browsers will work. And, um, and yeah, the, uh, the UI, Parka UI just saw, we profiled that with uh, also like just-in-time languages and all. So then we also very recently, uh, my coworker Kemal, he, uh, uh, and my coworker Javier, they both added support for Python and Ruby. So you can also support all the uh, fancy AI workloads and all the cool, exciting uh, AI stuff that we are running today. Um, definitely check it out. Uh, and we support uh, all architectures. So x86, uh, ARM64. Uh, the agent needs Linux to run, but uh, and x86 is like super simple. But even on my, uh, we use Macs actually at work for, uh, and it's we only have to have a Linux VM. We don't need emulation. Like we don't need to emulate x86 anymore. So we just have the ARM hardware uh, from the Mac, and like just have to have a Linux virtual machine, and it just works. <laughs> So, um, and we do all of this, uh, all the compiled languages and everything with or without frame pointers. So what we need to know about frame pointers is there like an extra register that's um, there on the hardware level, but a lot of compilers and binaries, they strip that. So with frame pointers, it's just like very easy, but without frame pointers, like I mentioned all the elf and dwarf, all that information from the binaries, we have to take like a lot of actually calculate the stacks uh, by hand. So uh, this is not something that's very easily done with low overhead and zero instrumentation. It took us like some six months extra uh, like to develop this. And initial support's fine, but every compiler has an edge case. So when we say we want to fully support it, we, we're actually looking for our end of and users and everybody in the community to try it out and tell us what are the edge cases, because it's um, impossible to replicate everything in a cloud environment in, uh, on our machines. So we try as much as possible to you know, every edge case for every compiler. And that's, I think, a very high goal for us to achieve. But we, we have been pretty good at getting there so far, and we will do so. Um, what kernel versions we support? Technically, we do also support some 4.19 and above versions, I think. But we always um, prefer version 5.3 plus, And even more preferable is the latest Linux versions. Uh, so right now, I think latest upstream is 6.3, 6.4, maybe even. But uh, uh, from like some Linux versions, like 5.2 to 6.2, the kernel itself has one or two eBPF bugs. And they have all been fixed upstream, but upstream moves really fast. And a lot of uh, cloud providers and people, they don't, uh, you know, even me, sometimes we just don't update our machines, right, or the uh, operating system. And uh, a lot of distributions, uh, they don't backport fixes. So we have workarounds on those bugs, but it's like sometimes it's a bit tricky, and we want our end users to have like a very smooth experience. So um, always update your uh, machines, people. Uh, and that's really all. Um, these are links I have added, how compilers actually, the edge cases, how compilers affect icicle graphs. So really edge cases about C++, Node.js, and um, um, funky things that uh, some virtual managers, uh, VMs do. So that's what the MI contained. These are all blog post links, uh, do check it out. And uh, so this is a roadmap that we have. 
For Parka, uh, the query language you just saw, we want to extend its capabilities, some more like autocomplete features and everything. Uh, more languages, you know, we want to support PHP. Uh, there's also been uh, asked for support for Perl. So we want to support Perl and uh, Camel and like basically every language we can. Uh, Mojo, that's like a very up and coming language for uh, AI workloads and all. And Mostly, we also want to have like build a community around this. We it's it's been two years, but we're still very new as far as open source communities go, and uh, we're doing this for like the long time thing. And we want to make uh, continuous profiling a regular part of your observability stack. So uh, please join us at the Parker office hours. Uh, join us in the Discord. Try out the product, uh, the tooling, and. Uh, Tell us how you feel about it and how we can make it even more easier for you. And so that was my talk. Thank you. I'm sorry I went like maybe five, ten, no, five minutes over time, I think. Uh, so I'm sorry for keeping you from lunch. And thanks for being very patient listeners. So that was all.